Um, for those who don't know me, my name's uh, Andrew Bombach. I'm one of the uh, nephrologists here at Columbia, uh, where I'm co-director of the Center for Glomerular Diseases, and it's a real honor to be giving the last scheduled talk um, of the day on maintenance therapy. Just to remind you, after my session, we have one final session, um, which is cases, um, and these cases will be given um, by myself, uh, my colleague at the Glomerular Center, Dr. Pietro Canetta, and two of our renal pathologists here at Columbia, Dominic Santriello and Satoru Kudose. So please, um, after my talk, uh, you will be uh, immediately greeted with two final cases of the day. So after hearing about induction therapy from Dr. Nachman, my job is to talk about maintenance therapy in ANCA-associated vasculitis. Um, here's my disclosures. And so one of the things that I want to just sort of stress as we get into the idea of maintenance, and I'm sure you've heard this throughout the day, is that um, we, we view ANCAs uh, uh, primarily by the type of ANCA that we're dealing with. So you've heard about classifying it as microscopic polyangiitis versus granulomatosis with polyangiitis or eosinophilic GPA. But really, when I view ANCAs in the clinic, uh, I don't really rely so heavily on that type of classification, but rather a classification that is primarily uh, based on the type of ANCA, whether it's MPO or PR3, and the organ involvement and the type of organ involvement that we're seeing. So this is from a paper um, that, I, that I did with um, a colleague in Spain where we proposed using this classification where we name the disease by the type of ANCA and the organ involvement. And the reason why this is important, as you've heard today, is that the type of ANCA really influences the phenotype and the clinical scenarios that you're seeing. And as we get into talking about maintenance therapy, the reason why this is so important is that the type of ANCA will actually influence some of the decision-making you make when you think about maintenance therapy. And even to be more specific, the type of ANCA and the organ involvement from that ANCA could influence your treatment decisions when it comes to maintenance. So what I'm, what I'm getting at here is that we've seen in many of the induction studies that the PR3 ANCA has a greater chance of response to induction therapy than the MPO ANCA, but the PR3 ANCA, especially when there's sinus, ENT, and lung involvement, has a higher rate of relapse than the MPO ANCA. So these are the types of things you want to factor in as you're thinking about maintenance therapy. If you have a patient whose MPO has gone negative at six months and is in clinical remission, and you have a patient whose PR3 has gone negative and is in clinical remission at six months, and you're entering into the maintenance phase, you still have two different patients, and their risk for relapses are different, and you may need to consider different maintenance regimens based on the type of ANCA that you're dealing with. Now, what do we do when we treat with maintenance, assuming the patient has gotten into remission after using the induction regimens that Dr. Nachman just spoke of? Well, the first thing is they should be tapered off of steroids if they're not already off steroids, unless there's a pressing indication for it. But the, the era of keeping people on a little bit of steroids for ANCA maintenance is over, and you really should be getting them off. When I was trained, the most commonly used maintenance treatment was azathioprine. And I'll show you the data on that, but we've really moved away from using azathioprine um, to a rituximab-based regimen. But if you're still using azathioprine, this is the typical regimen that most people will use, starting at two milligrams per kilogram per day, and then at six months, starting to lower that dose by, by uh, uh, half a milligram per kilogram per day. And the goal being that somewhere around 24 months into maintenance, you can consider stopping. Now, it's really coincidental that I'm following Dr. Nachman because I learned ANCA in the clinic from Drs. Nachman and Falk when I trained at UNC. And, and what they used to always say in their notes and in discussing patients when, when we were talking about maintenance was uh, whether or not the patient was in remission, but also whether or not they were on maintenance, whether or not their immunosuppression was tapering or low dose, and then what they would call the holy grail which is when they were in remission off immunosuppression. And this very specific language and the way they describe their patients on maintenance really had an impact on me because it's so important to think about maintenance as a prolonged course. And the goal is to get these patients to less and less and less immunosuppression without them relapsing as you work towards that potential holy grail of getting them off of immunosuppression altogether. So what do we call stable? What is complete remission? Well, if you're in a clinical trial, it's a Birmingham vasculitis score of zero, 
which denotes no clinical radiologic or pathologic evidence of active disease. And if you've ever done an ANCA trial, you'll, you know that there's a big checklist that you go through to get a Birmingham vasculitis score. No one does that in clinic for the most part, but what we do in clinic is very similar to a BVAS score in that the BVAS score that you get in clinic uh, is very much um, using the same parameters that you would use uh, in, in calculating a BVAS score. So you're looking at ANCA titers, you're looking at serum creatinine levels, you're looking at the history and physical, you're looking at the SED rate CRP, you're looking at proteinuria hematuria, and you're looking at imaging, and you really wanna have no evidence that there's any active disease to say somebody's in complete remission. Oops, sorry. I think I might have messed up the slide progression. Okay, perfect. So why were we using azathioprine preferentially as the main immunosuppression? It was mostly based on the IMPROVE trial. And the IMPROVE trial put azathioprine head-to-head -head against mycophenolate and showed that the risk of relapse was higher in mycophenolate, even with all the adjustments that were made, um, including the 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 route of cyclophosphamide for induction. And also when relapses were occurring, they were occurring much faster with mycophenolate than they were with azathioprine. So azathioprine clearly looked better than mycophenolate as a maintenance therapy for, for, uh, for ANCA. However, we've moved away from that to preferentially using rituximab. And this is a very nice schema of the trials that have really put rituximab as the first or the preferred uh, maintenance regimen for our patients. And I want to give a shout out to Jithu Kurian, who on Twitter actually had this beautiful um, thread of, of slides summarizing some of the, the, the pivotal trials of maintenance therapy in ANCA. And this is one of the, the slides that he showed um, in that thread that um, shows the progression of some of these trials. So going from the main Ritzan study in 2014 to main Ritzan 3 in 2020, you see that each trial adds a little bit extra information as to why we would use rituximab preferentially over azathioprine. So I'm going to go through each of these in turn, so don't worry if you're not taking in everything on this slide. Let's start with the original main Ritzan study, which compares rituximab versus azathioprine for maintenance in ANCA-associated vasculitis. And you can see on the, on, the, on the slide, the maintenance regimen that they use is 500 milligrams of rituximab um, in the beginning of maintenance, dosed twice, so a total of 1,000 milligrams to begin maintenance, and then at month 6, 12, and 18, just giving 500 milligrams. So 1,000 milligrams to start maintenance, and then 500 milligrams every six months afterwards, a total of four rounds of rituximab. And you can see that rituximab is clearly outperforming azathioprine, especially as azathioprine is being weaned off. There's much more relapses occurring in the patients who were randomized to azathioprine than to rituximab. Now, one of the uh, pushbacks against this study is that there were too many PR3s, not enough MPOs in this study. So a potentially a, uh, a population in the study that was more primed for relapses and a, and a, and a call to, to repeat these this type of study with more MPO representation um, was heard because you'll see that in the, the subsequent studies, there's, there's a better breakdown of having PR3 versus MPO. But one of the pushbacks on this is based on that idea that PR3s and MPOs have, sl have different relapse risks um, based on their ANCA subtypes. So the Ritazaram study, which looks almost identical to the main Ritzan study in terms of its results, again, showing a benefit of rituximab compared to azathioprine as a maintenance therapy. But here the difference is there's more MPOs in this study. So this is an improvement upon the main Ritzan and that we get more information now about using uh, this, this regimen of rituximab for maintenance when you have an MPO anchor and it's not heavily weighted towards PR3s. Then we get to main Ritzan 2 study, and this is a visual abstract by that same nephrologist, Jithu Kurian, so thank you um, for, for his uh, beautiful representation of this study. But here what they're looking at is that fixed dose of uh, rituximab regimen uh, for maintenance that was used in the main Ritzan study to a more tailored dose. And by tailored, they mean tailoring it to repopulation of the CD19 levels. So basically waiting for the B cells to, to uh, reemerge um, 
and then dosing the rituximab. But the idea being that maybe you could use less rituximab if you're waiting for the B cells to repopulate rather than automatically scheduling the rituximab every six months. I can tell you, as someone who uses a lot of rituximab for maintenance remission, um, I think this uh, regimen of tailoring it to B cell repopulation, and you'll see the relapse rates are higher, about twice as high um, in this study, um, for those who did this tailored version versus the scheduled version, patients actually, I think, do, would prefer the scheduled regimen, all things being equal, because what we do is when we start maintenance, we say, okay, you can now schedule out. You're going to be getting your, your infusion now. You'll be getting your infusion six months from now, 12 months from now, 18 months from now. Put it on the calendar. Get ready for it. And I think that's very, very you know, easy for patients to know what to expect in terms of their maintenance regimen, rather than saying, okay, well, we're going to wait to see when your B cells come back, and then we may or may not give it to you. So this study did not support that tailored regimen and uh, confirmed that this fixed dose schedule of every six months appears to be the better way to proceed. This is the main Ritsan 3 study, um, which is uh, looking at the, the duration of the use of, of rituximab for maintenance therapy. And so here they're looking at uh, prolonging maintenance therapy uh, in patients with ANCA vasculitis beyond that original 18-month regimen that we showed in the main Ritsan study. So should we be giving rituximab even longer? So comparing now rituximab against placebo, and you can see that the group that stays on rituximab clearly has significantly less relapses versus the groups that came off of rituximab. So does this mean that we should continue to extend rituximab you know, for another, uh, essentially, four more doses every six months, so extending the maintenance regimen for another two years? Well, I, I'll go over this when we talk about when to do that, but I think there are some subgroups that clearly you want to think about doing that. On the, on the flip side, there are some subgroups where I think we can end the maintenance therapy after the traditional rituximab maintenance-based regimen that's set out in main Ritsan without prolonging the course beyond that original uh, regimen. It's important, again, when you're looking at these maintenance studies to look at the types of patients that have been enrolled in these studies. Um, because again, you want to make sure you're getting representation of the right kinds of, of, of uh, patients and the kinds that you will see in clinic. So is it all GPAs? Is it all PR3 ANCAs? No, you actually get some nice representation of both subtypes in this study. Is it all newly diagnosed disease or is it relapsing disease? The relapsing disease clearly is going to have a higher risk of relapse regardless of which regimen they've been randomized to because once you've relapsed once, you clearly have a, a, a risk of relapsing again that's going to be enhanced. So I think it's very helpful when you look at these types of studies to really examine what we call table one to make sure these are the kinds of patients that you would see in your clinic. Especially as nephrologists, are we seeing good representation of, P, of MPO ANCAs and potentially renal limited uh, vasculitis from MPO ANCAs? Um, are we seeing uh, you know high rates of relapse because they're preferentially enrolling PR3 ANCAs? So make those make those decisions as you scroll through Table One in these studies. But for the most part, the main Ritsan three study is a pretty well uh, represented population. So this is how I treat ANCA and combining both um, induction and maintenance therapy um, in my own clinic. Um, and you'll see that uh, I did a little bit of a tweak on the, the rituximab maintenance regimen, um, as I'll explain. So for, for mild to moderate disease, I give, as, part of, my, as my, part of my induction, rituximab one gram on days one and 14. And then once, they get, once they're in remission, Instead of doing two doses of 500 milligrams for the ease of the patient, I just give one dose of one gram at six months, and then I give a dose of 500 milligrams at 12, 18, and 24 months. And then, with the exception of some specific situations, no further immunosuppression provided they're in, cl in clinical remission. And we went over that on the earlier slide what parameters I need to call them being in clinical remission, not just looking at creatinine, but looking at their urine, looking at their ANCA subtypes, looking at, um, looking at the ANCA levels, looking at SED rates, CRPs, et cetera. And also, of course, listening to the patient. Now, if there is severe disease, because we got a lot of questions during the last talk, you know, when do you use cyclophosphamide? Do you ever combine cyclophosphamide 
with rituximab. So when there's severe disease, and by severe disease, for me, that means a, a significant crescentic burden on the biopsy um, and or, and usually it's and, a rapidly rising creatinine, I start with two doses of IV cyclophosphamide on day one and day 28, and then I move into this exact rituximab-based regimen. So I hit them early with two doses of IV cyclophosphamide, then I complete my induction with rituximab one gram times two, and then at month six, I go back to this maintenance regimen, assuming they're in remission, one gram at six months, 500 at 12, 18, and 24 months, and again, no further immunosuppression. Now, what do we make of this main Ritsan 3 study, which says, well, consider doing four more doses of rituximab because you get an even better prevention of relapse. So in which populations would I consider these additional doses of rituximab? And here I'm saying 18 months. Well, I would consider this additional course of maintenance beyond the original main Ritsan regimen if the patient's PR3 positive, I, I will consider it. This doesn't mean I automatically will, but I will think about it. If they're PR3 positive and they had sinus and ENT involvement, uh, makes me consider it more. If they have PR3 positive sinus, ENT involvement, and a tobacco history, that makes me consider it even more. And then finally, history of relapsing disease really makes me consider it more because once you've had one relapse, we know you're at a higher risk for relapse. So only one, only one of these factors you, sh you should think about extending maintenance beyond the original 24-month mark. But if you have more than one of these factors, two, three, or four of these factors, really look hard at that main Ritsan 3 study and say, should I be extending maintenance beyond 24 months, perhaps to 36 months, perhaps to 48 months? And again, really be confident when you're stopping maintenance that you can monitor these patients for relapse if they have these, these risk factors because they are at higher risk. Okay, I know Dr. Nachman just presented these data from the Advocate study, but I wanna get into Advocate with a view solely towards maintenance therapy. Um, it's why would I be showing an induction study if I'm interested in talking to you about maintenance therapy? Well, the reason why is that there's something very interesting about the Advocate study. If you look at this study in detail, the induction regimen is up to the discretion of the nephrologist or the rheumatologist. You either give rituximab at, at the 375 milligram per meter squared dosing for four weeks or cyclophosphamide. But look at this, only the people who did cyclophosphamide were then put on maintenance therapy with azathioprine. The group that got rituximab as their induction did not get maintenance therapy, unless you're saying the extension of avacopan to one year is their maintenance therapy. But this is really viewed as part of the induction regimen, not part of the maintenance. So the idea is that in this study, you are getting a potential window on a group that was treated with induction therapy without maintenance therapy. Now, you may say this seems a little bit, um, you know, outside the realm of, of what we normally do. But remember, the RAVE study did this exact same regimen. They gave rituximab alone without any maintenance therapy. And what they showed was that rituximab alone, if you go out to one and a half to two years, rituximab as an induction therapy without maintenance therapy performed equally to getting cyclophosphamide followed by azathioprine maintenance therapy in terms of relapses. Now, they, neither of them performed as well as we would like, which is why we now extend the rituximab beyond induction and use it for maintenance. And we went over all those studies um, in this talk that validate that. But perhaps if we add complement blockade into the treatment regimen very early, we can go back to that idea that there may be some patients that may not need maintenance therapy at all. So the advocate results, as I'm showing it to you here, um, and Dr. Nachman went over them with you as well. I'm not going to go too much into this um, other than to say that um, the use of avacopan clearly um, showed that it could replace prednisone um, as a, as a non-inferior drug. Um, and the extension out to a year when the, the, the placebo group was off of, off of steroids uh, showed some improvement in results compared to, to, to the steroid group. And of course, the longer this study goes on, you see the, the line separating because the vacopan is extended out to a year 
whereas the prednisone group is essentially stopping at six months. So this is very interesting because we're starting to see real world data emerge on using this drug. And the question of whether or not these patients can truly go without maintenance therapy. I think we should be very cautious. If I was going to use Avacopan and rituximab for induction and then not use maintenance therapy as was done in the advocate study, I would want to cherry pick and really make sure I was using it for the mildest forms of ANCA. So which types of patients would I think about doing it? Well, I would do it, for example, in patients who had MPO ANCAs rather than PR3s, where their risk of relapse is already low. I would do it for patients who had renal limited disease without any sinus, ENT, or lung involvement. I would do it in patients who had relatively low MPO titers at the time of beginning induction and who have gone negative, um, clearly negative by six months and have other parameters of clinical remission. And I would do it in patients who are very reliable, where I know that they will do things like get frequent lab work and check in with me so that if there's any signs that foregoing maintenance um, has led to a relapse, we'll catch it as early as possible. So I think it, it does exist, this possibility of using a regimen where you, you start with rituximab induction and start with the vacopan and continue a vacopan for a year, but there's no further rituximab dosing beyond what was used in induction. And some of these patients can go without maintenance rituximab or maintenance of any immunosuppression. And after one year, they're completely off of all immunomodulatory medications. We're going to see some of this real world data emerge now that that that, that Avacopan is being used in clinics. But I think if you're going to go with that strategy, you want to make sure you're using it for the select patients that have the lower risk of relapse and not try this in the more higher risk patients for relapse. So one of the things I always like to sort of leave people with as we uh, get ready to move into our, into our cases, but one of the things I like to um, leave people with is just how much the treatment of ANCA-associated glomerulonephritis has changed in a very short period of time. Um, and I'm highlighting here in yellow just the maintenance parts that have changed. But if you think about all of, of ANCA, every part of the treatment has changed. But if we just focus on maintenance, which is the, the topic of this talk, in 2010, which was just 13 years ago, the standard of care was to use azathioprine for maintenance. And we did not have any data um, for using anything other than azathioprine. And so, while people were using mycophenolate, the data suggested azathioprine was a better uh, maintenance regimen. In 2015, we, five years later, we already had data that suggested you could use rituximab not just for induction, but also for maintenance. So in just a five-year period with well-done clinical trials, you had randomized data to support the use of using rituximab as your maintenance therapy. And now in 2023, with the Advocate study, you have some clinical trial data that suggests that if you use rituximab for induction, you may be able to forego maintenance if you're using complement blockade for a year. Now, again, I put in parentheses, this should be phenotype dependent because I do think you want to make sure if you're going to use that kind of, of maintenance-free regimen, you want to make sure you're using it in patients who are at the lowest risk. So a big shift in maintenance over a relatively short period of time where we moved away from using azathioprine, we're relying primarily on rituximab, and we have these very well done trials that allow you to tailor and personalize your approach for how you're gonna use maintenance. So on the one hand, you have the study like the main Rutsan 3, which is saying you might wanna extend maintenance beyond 24 months to 36 and 48 months and give more maintenance rituximab. And I think that makes sense for some patients who are at the highest risk for relapse. On the other side, you have the advocate study and you have the original RAVE study, which says that there are some patients who will not relapse even without maintenance, where if you induce with rituximab and potentially add complement blockade on top of inducing with rituximab, you can forego maintenance in those patients who are particularly low risk for relapse. So the better you understand your patient's risk for relapse, the better you can tailor their maintenance therapy and make sure you're, you're giving maintenance to those who absolutely need it.